Uh, Pat McCann is a collector and historian. He grew up in eastern Canada and lived there for many years. <coughs> From an early age, Pat was interested in collecting and over the years has collected many interesting pieces of furniture, art and artifacts. In 1994, Pat moved with his family to Calgary to become the general manager of the Ranchman's Club. After arriving at the Ranchman's Club, he discovered boxes and drawers of files containing the history of any person who'd ever been a member of the Ranchman's Club in Calgary. And these dated back as far as 1891. Pat hired a summer student to organize all these records. Today, these files are used by historians as a valuable historical resource. Pat retired from the Ranchman's Club in 2009. On his retirement, he was given an honorary membership to the Ranchman's Club. At the time, the only other person to receive an award like this was Edward, Prince of Wales, who later became Edward VIII. While Pat was general manager at the Ranchman's Club, he met Dr. Don Smith, a history professor at the University of Calgary. And did historic, who did historic research using the files at the club. After Don retired from the university, he and several other professors formed a seniors group called CAL, C -A -L -L, Calgary Association of Lifelong Learners. Over the years, the group has grown to over 500 people who take part in courses and events put on by CAL and its members. Pat became a call board member and has held the position for five years. Early next year, an exciting event will take place when call moves into the new space at the old King Edward School, C space. Commercial airlines in Canada began in the late 1930s, and Pat's mother was the first chief stewardess of 4TCA Airlines. This evening, Pat is going to tell us about his mom, her job, and it <clears throat> and her job as an airline stewardess and relate some of her early experiences. Let's welcome Pat. Everybody, this evening I'm going to ask you a question after you've looked at it. So if you want to take a peek at it, it's kind of interesting. And uh, you know have seen it, so just take a peek at it now to see if you can answer a question or two. Um, <coughs> I must say that I'm here sort of under false pretenses because really I don't know an awful lot about TCA. Uh, I don't know much about airplanes, I don't know much about the history of TCA, but what I do know is that my mother was uh, one of the first stewardesses for TCA. So I have always been told stories through her eyes. Uh, I've also been able to find a number of articles in which my mother was part and parcel of uh, during the early years of TransCanada Airlines. Now, I'm going to be reading a few things to you because some of the stuff gets a little more complicated and this is not going to happen sort of chronologically because things are going to go back and forth a little bit. So you're going to have to bear with me uh, as I, I do this. Uh, to give you a bit of background about my mother, <laughs> Mother was born in uh, Maydock, Ontario, and uh, January 16, 1916. Uh, she was uh, one of six children. Uh, I had, and I'm going to, because it's very interesting as to why she got to Toronto and why she became a stewardess in time. Her, uh, the eldest sister uh, was Anne Catherine Ann Murphy. Now, Anne Catherine Ann. Let me go back. In 1918, 19, when the uh, Spanish influenza uh, hit, my mother's mother passed away. Um, and at that time, there were six children. There was my Aunt Catherine Ann, who left home at 18 uh, and became quite successful, went to New York, became quite su successful uh, as soon as she finished high school. Uh, and started her own business in New York. Um, after that, my grandfather remarried, and he married someone who had two daughters. And you talk about the Wicked Witch of the whatever, I guess she was the Wicked Witch, and these children just did not get along with their, with their stepmother. So they all started leaving home. At, as soon as they reached 18, they were gone. So my Aunt Margaret, 
uh, went to Toronto and to become a nurse. So she went to St. Mike's uh, in Toronto. And uh, the next child down ran away from home when he was 18 and he ended up being a clothier and ended up having his own business uh, in St. Mary's, Ontario. And the next one was my mother and then there was my younger, no, there's Francis, who was the only one who went to university and he became the head of the, uh, I'm going to call it the, the uh, cheese department of, uh, in Ottawa. So he would go out and inspect dairies and that sort of thing. And the youngest one, my mother being the second youngest, the youngest one, he ran away from home when he was 16. And he went to work at a dairy in Tilsonburg, Ontario. And by the time he was 23, he owned the dairy. So they're all very entrepreneurial. <laughs> Well, mother wasn't sure what she was going to do, and her sister talked her into coming to St. Mike's to become a nurse. So as you probably know, uh, all of the stewardesses back in 1938 had to be a nurse. Now, it's interesting. Uh, Mom didn't, Mom graduated from nursing school in 1938. And she, the first stewardess, for TransCanada Airlines was hired in 1938. And I often wondered why they had to be nurses. Well, I found out they had to be nurses because a lot of the people flying on these airplanes, which were quite small, were getting sick. And they were throwing up and they were having headaches and what have you. And the stewards who were flying uh, couldn't handle this, so they decided, first of all, that uh, during the war there were a lot of men who were, they were taking off, and so they decided to hire women, but they had to be nurses. They figured that if, if a nurse was on board, it would help uh, as far as uh, TCA was concerned. Now, restrictions. You had to be a nurse. You had to be between five feet and five feet foot five inches tall. You had to be unmarried. You had to weigh between 115 pounds and 120 pounds. You were, your hairstyle was controlled. Your cosmetics were controlled. Even the length of your nails were controlled. So you wonder why they would want to do, why they would want to become a stewardess. Well, the incentive was they made $25 more a month than a nurse did they were making $125 uh, a month. Mom did not get into, uh, into becoming a stewardess until 1941. Now the reason I'm sort of here is because Neil was doing something with Call at one point in time where we were talking about antiques and collectibles and he, wa he was talking about uh, paper things, you know, uh, we were talking about things that may be of interest to people. And when my mother passed away, I found this. And this is her log of her flights. And this log is every single flight she took from 1941 to 1943. And when you go into this log, you find out the size of the aircraft, the first pilot, the second pilot, you find out uh, exactly uh, some of the people who were famous people were on board. You find out um, how long it took them to fly from point A to point B, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the interesting thing is that during their time as stewardesses, when they were being trained, they never, my mother's first flight, she never took a flight until her first flight as a stewardess. They wouldn't allow them to go up because of the rationing of gas was so tight that they said, well, we're not going to just take these women up there and teach them how to be stewardesses. So it would be their first flight. My well, mother's first flight was a very famous, famous flight. And I'm going to read to you the front page of the Toronto Star. And this was her very first flight, and it was on the exact date was July the 8th, 1941. 
blown off its course by high winds when one of its two motors went dead. A Trans-Canada Airlines plane landed safely early today in Rochester, New York. It carried a full load of 10 passengers and a crew of three. Three hours later, the passengers were transferred to another TCA ship, they called them ships in those days, and brought to Malton Airport, which is in Toronto. They arrived at 6.30 a.m., nearly seven hours overdue. Their plan, plane was transcontinental trip number three from Montreal to Vancouver. Um, oh, just go on, hold on for a second. Yeah, okay. The big ship, a Lockheed 14, left Ottawa at 11.27 p.m., about 30 minutes before schedule, and should have arrived at Malton shortly after midnight. The machine reached Stirling, a range station north of Lake Ontario, where the course is changed for Toronto, and then the motor quit. It landed in Rochester at 1.30 a.m. The unusual TCA experience marked the first regular flight of the stewardess, Delia Murphy, mother, of Toronto. According to her passengers, she was as calm as a veteran throughout. Now, I've heard this story many times with mother, and that was in 1941. I want you to hear my mother's version. Uh, and this was in 1980. Uh, mother was interviewed in 1980. They, they had a reunion of a number of stewardesses. And she um, was being interviewed, interesting, by, by a lady by the name of Deborah Reed. Now, Deborah Reed was also a reporter here for The Sun back in, I think, in the 80s. I'm going to say 70s and 80s. Anyway. This is what happened. Um, okay, so they're talking about, I'll start here. The early stewardesses were something of celebrities with their pictures in the newspapers and public appearances arranged by airlines to emphasize the safety of flying. Breathless newspaper accounts referred to them as traveling on those 180 mile an hour skyliners praised their charm and beauty, and mentioned that the average length of service was only between three and four months. So most stewardesses only lasted three or four months. There's a number of reasons for that. And we'll go on for the, in a minute. The turnover was so enormous that the TCA training school at Winnipeg couldn't keep up with Cupid. You see, you couldn't be married and be a stewardess. So four, of course, stewardess had to quit if they married. <clears throat> Delia Forrest. Now, that can get confusing. My mother was widowed three times, so she has a number of names. <laughs> she was Delia Murphy. I'm McCann. She married Dr. Bardaval. Then she was married to Jim Forrest. So this is during the Forrest era. This was the last. This was her third husband. Four course stewardesses had to quit if they married. Delia Forrest was one that didn't. She was a stewardess from 1941 to 1943, continuing almost eight months after marrying her husband, my father. He called me and said he had to go overseas and he thought we should get married, so we just got married very quietly, says the petite blonde. The husband of one of her patients had originally convinced her to try becoming a stewardess, says Delia, who was Delia Murphy. Then, I thought you had to be almost like a movie actress, she says. Now, with a laugh, she was thrilled to death when accepted, even though wartime restrictions on fuel meant there could be no training flights. So it was that on her very first trip on an airplane, Delia found herself trying to calm passengers when the pilot became lost and the, place was, the plane was blown miles off course over Lake Ontario. I'd never been higher than an apple tree before, so I didn't know enough to be frightened. We were nurses then and trained to be more concerned about our patients. Of course, Delia's fiancé was waiting in Toronto, and he was panicking, but Delia kept calm. I didn't know what Toronto looked like, but I would look out and say, yes, that's it. 
I knew we were over the States. I'd look out and see a sign for Schlitz beer and immediately say, oh, look over there, and point to the opposite direction. Eventually, they landed in Rochester. Um, so I think, you know, it's interesting with stewardesses when I, uh, I, I think how difficult, I guess, it was for some of these gals once they become nurses because Truthfully, one of the reasons stewardesses were hired, as I said before, is because these flights were pretty rough. And uh, I know that um, a lot of them, uh, because they, they, things decompress because it didn't, you know, when they're up in the air, uh, these planes didn't fly that high. They had to use oxygen a lot. People were getting sick. There were very bumpy rides. And interestingly enough, uh, I read that in 1939, the very first flight from Montreal to Vancouver, this is how you would go. You went from Montreal to Vancouver, you had stopovers in Ottawa, North Bay, Capus Casey, Winnipeg, Regina, Lethbridge, and Edmonton, and then you went on to Vancouver. <laughs> they got very excited when they decided that they could advertise that you could fly from Ottawa to Vancouver in 17 hours. Uh, because it was these planes were traveling around 300 miles, 300 miles an hour, but of course they had to keep refueling. And you know, these planes only held 10 or 14 people. That was, that was it, uh, 10 or 14 people. Now, when that plane went off course, I found this quite interesting. Um, if you TCA was the first airline to set up a system that, uh, and as it says here, operators at these points, okay, so what they do is they decided that they were going to have eyes on the ground. So they had a number of people who would say, say uh, you know, um, we've got a flight that's off course, we've got a problem. So what they would do is they would say, okay, in a few minutes, at less than a thousand pairs of eyes and ears, TCA officials estimate, were watching and listening um, because farmers, and I got another article, farmers, uh, here we go. Uh, TCA has a unique auxiliary checking system, which it puts into operation when it fails to contact one of its airlines in transit for a considerable period. When an airport dispatcher fails to establish radio contact with a ship, the plane, bound for his city and believes that something is wrong, he sends out an emergency call to a large army of spotters in the form of farmers, postmasters, railway men, who begin watching for the missing plane. The spotters in turn notify hundreds of residents in their, dis in their districts and soon thousands of eyes are watching for the ship. The system has worked successfully for the first time in early July, which was Mom's first flight. So it's the first time they did it. Other airlines decided that they were going to take on the, exactly the same uh, system. So many airlines around the world were doing exactly the same thing. The other interesting thing is when they flew from this flight from Edmonton to Vancouver, they couldn't fly over the mountains. They went in between. They went in the passes of the mountains. They couldn't fly that high. They couldn't get up that high. So, uh, and if they did, then you really have a problem because people's ears would be popping, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. And, and I think that's one of the things, too. As soon as you got on a plane, the first thing they gave you was a piece of gum. So that's what you had. I uh, uh, think that um, in this blog, and you're more than welcome to look at it. It's, it's really quite interesting. Uh, Mother will put down if there's any famous people on her flight. Now remember, there are only 10, 12 people on the flight. But I noticed that she really didn't start doing this until they started flying from Toronto to New York. And the first flight from Toronto to New York was on January the 17th, 1940, 1942, I believe, 42. So, uh, when that flight started to um, take off, they went into a Lodestar 18, which held 14 passengers. The plane that she'd been flying in uh, 
uh, held 10. So there were 18, 14 passengers on this flight. And it seems that they thought that this was really going to take off. And if I take a look at um, her log, this is how many people flew to New York uh, in 1941, starting on January the 17th. Three, five, five, one, six, two, four, zero, zero, five, two, four, three. Keeps on going. Oh, we did get 14. Five, zero, four, four, one. So I think what TCA really wanted to do is start promoting as much as they possibly could. Start promoting uh, flights to, uh, to pick people who were afraid to fly. And uh, so they were trying to let these, uh, let everybody know it was quite safe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, a lot of advertising started to take place. Anyway, I'm just going to mention to you, and I've got them that written down here. Here are a few people that uh, were on her flights. Sally O'Neill. There were only three people on that flight. Anybody know who Sally O'Neill was? I didn't either. She made uh, actress made 40 movies, uh, and they gave me a list of movies. But I guess you're all far too young because most of them were. I think, silent pictures. <laughs> uh, do you know who Henry Aldrich and uh, Homer Brown were? Yeah. They were famous uh, on the radio. And she wrote down those names, but that wasn't their actual name. That's who, that was the characters that they played on radio and uh, for quite a Paul Robinson. Does anybody know who the black singer was, Paul Robinson? He was a famous opera singer, and uh, there's some interesting stories about him trying to get across the border one time. Um, when, when there's a picture of him with him there, because when there were some people coming off the planes, they wanted the, the stewardess to have their picture taken with them, because they started promoting, you'll see in newspaper ar ar items, that they wanted to promote famous people flying. There was, um, Kate Smith and her whole band. So that's why that flight, there were 14 people. I guess she had a big band. So there you go. Uh, Dion, Miss Dion of the Dion Quintuplets uh, flew. So I can tell you, uh, Billy Bishop. Uh, Billy Bishop uh, on June the 18th, 1943, at uh, 3 in the afternoon, flew from Toronto to New York City. And I know that because it's sweet, <laughs> for sure. Um, now, the other thing that these stu stewardesses did was do an awful lot of sort of advertising. Now, that picture that I hung around, does anybody know who that gentleman is? Well, that's my mother. Do you know who that was? Do you know who that is? Now that picture, uh, he never flew on that plane. No, it's Errol Flynn. And he never flew on that plane. There's a reason why he's there, and it's so subtle. I didn't quite figure it all out until later. Can you figure out what they were advertising? Kleenex. You saw the box of cleaning. Yeah. Here it is. Oh, here's a whole article uh, about Kleenex. And there's my mother with Kleenex. And it's going on about all clear, checking up before signing off duty. Delia says, I find Kleenex so handy for applying and removing makeup as well as dozens of other handy uses every day. There you go. They're all, this is all about Kleenex. Um, so, they use stewardesses quite often uh, for a lot of advertising, and that's why you see in a lot of these articles, you're going to see different stewardesses showing how wonderful and lovely it is to go flying until you get up there and start, <laughs> start throwing up, I guess. Um, a few things that I thought might be of interest. The one reason they say that the <coughs> stewardesses had to be a certain weight and a certain height and a certain whatever is because the fold-down jump seat for the stewardesses was one reason why they had to be between five feet and five foot five, it says here. 
uh, after a 10-day uh, period in Winnipeg and fitting it, oh, their uniforms. Their uniforms were made by tip-top tailors. Uh, they wanted the uniform, the first uniform was apparently quite ugly, but the second uniform, they wanted it to look, look like a military uniform. So if you see the picture, uh, see the pictures here, and here's her graduating class, by the way, which was, ended up being in the Gold Mail and also in the Star. Um, and she's the fourth from the, she's actually the tallest. Um, because they wanted to show that these lovely nurses were going to take you on these lovely flights and the way you were going to go. So uh, this, these pictures uh, did show up here. And this is interesting too. Uh, one of the pictures for the Kleenex ends up just as an, an ad for TCA. And this is what it says, if you can get away with this today. Look at this TCA treat. <laughs> Who wouldn't travel by air to help speed up Canada, Canada's war effort when a sweet stewardess like Delia Murphy makes the prospect so attractive? Don't be deceived, though. There is more here than a cheery smile. Delia is a competent trained nurse, knows how to make war-weary air travelers relax and rest. Just one point. Uh, part of the reason, too, with, with the height of those aircraft, the Lockheed were very narrow for sure. Yes, yes. Uh, as time went on, they did allow an increase in height. They went up an inch at a time roughly until they got to the larger aircraft. They, they, they did, and uh, they're, they're absolutely right. And one of the, but the other reason they were saying here somewhere I read is that they didn't want them to be too big because when they bent over, they looked larger. <laughs> I don't know what they were referring to, but that's what they, that's what the is. <laughs> I think they meant bigger. Um, I, uh, I think that uh, there were some interesting stories from the very first stewardess who talks about um, some of the things that they didn't realize were going to happen when they first started flying. And, uh, and this is quite interesting because I thought I'm going to talk to you a bit about, if I can find it here, okay. Um, this article is the same article that, uh, in 1980, talking to one of the very first stewardesses, and she's saying this, uh, on my second flight, I opened the boxes, these boxes being the lunch boxes, and uh, found this large black worm lying on top of the sandwiches. I didn't know what it was. It turned out to be a banana. The minute there was no pressure, they shriveled up and turned black. So this happened quite often, and you'll be interested in knowing this. Although the lunches and sour milk could usually be replaced when they landed in Regina, the fountain pen problem was more severe. More than one nervous executive ruined a good suit when the drop in pressure caused a pocketed pen to leak. Nellie McClung, famous Canadian feminist and author, was not immune. Then in her late 60s, she boarded a TCA plane in Vancouver, bound for a lecture series at McGill University. She was all dressed up in this beautiful dove gray suit that she planned to lecture in. She had never had a flight on an aircraft before and was just so excited about the whole thing that as I was coming back from giving out the gum, I saw this great big mauve spot on her purse. That ink was all over her suit. <laughs> so no one was immune, I guess. Um, so many, many stories about some of the uh, stewardesses and some of the things that they went through, and I think it's, it's quite fitting that uh, many of the times that these stewardesses uh, were flying, uh, there are two or three instances where a stewardess went on her first flight and never went on a flight after that. Uh, and that's, that's what they say, that uh, it's very difficult for them to, to find people who are going to actually become stewardesses because they you had to be a nurse, then you had to be between 25 and 30, and of course when you were 30 you were no longer a stewardess, so you know, it's not a long, long career for these people. So uh, I, I think, and I, I noticed here, and I've got a whole, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, and that my mother was asked 
to go to different schools and talk to young girls to see if they could talk them into becoming, going into nursing and becoming stewardesses. So she talked quite often about uh, how great it was to be a stewardess. Now, she lasted a fair length of time. I suspect the reason she left uh, is because after she was she was married and kept it hidden for eight months, but I think there was something coming along and I don't think she could keep it hidden any longer. <laughs> and I believe that's why she ended up having to give her notice. Um, the other thing is that mom, they didn't have the managers of the of the um, airports were basically in charge of some of the stewardesses that were local, although quite often uh, you would fly from point A to point B to point C to point D. And many of the flights, if you look at her log, many of the flights, if, she, if you're going to, uh, say, Montreal, they would go through Ottawa. So people are going up and down, up and down all the time. Um, so they decided at one point in time they needed a female stewardess, I guess, to become their chief stewardess. The mother was appointed the chief stewardess for Transcan Airlines. And uh, in 1943, it was their first chief stewardess that they had appointed. And I remember Mother telling me some interesting stories. During the war, um, I guess these women couldn't get nylons. And one of the prerequisites is you had to wear nylons with a seam down the back, I guess. And that's when nylons were two socks, not one, I guess. And my mother said that it was very difficult to get nylons, although she quite often could get them because she was on that New York, because you could get them in the States, but not in Canada. So she said she could remember many times having a girl lie down on, the, on her tummy on the bed and drawing lines with, <laughs> down the back of her leg to make it look like she was wearing nylons because that was part of the prerequisite. So she said she had to interview many, uh, many gals and you know, and they had to be a certain, there had to be a certain flair to these uh, girls, and there you go. Uh, she, I got things were minutes of some of their, their meetings. Um, every every uh, flight had to sub, the stewardess had to submit a report talking about flight conditions en route, al altitudes flown, what complaints medications administered, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I have all the original documents sort of in here, and uh, what can I say? So I'm going to end up, oh, by the way, th I thought this was interesting. This is my mother's notebook from her nursing school. And if you look at it, uh, I, I, I remember seeing it, and I said, you know, it's very detailed. In those days, they just couldn't afford to buy books. So you literally wrote your own, I mean, you not only took notes, but you, t and so if you go alphabetically and you say, oh, D, I can't even pronounce that word, uh, E, eyes, ears, nose, and throat. And it goes on and on and on. And it's all beautifully, beautifully written. Most kids today probably couldn't read it, but there you go, because it's, there you go. Uh, but I'm going to end up by saying, I got a, a napkin. There are a few other things in here, but I have a napkin uh, from TCA, and it says, and someone wrote a note to my mother on this napkin and gave it to her, and it says, the cheese you're serving is quite fine. I'm sure it's of the very highest quality. No need for you besides to hand out wine with your intoxicating personality. <laughs> <laughs> so that's on a TCA napkin that her serviette that she got. Anyway, there's a number of things here. I, uh, there's, this is quite interesting too, if someone wants to. Uh, mother on the, t I'm gonna say the 25th anniversary of TCA, and I think it was the 25th anniversary. Um, she was uh, asked to go to, uh, she was asked to do, to take some flights, and I'm not quite sure which flight she was taking, but a bunch of them were taking different flights as part of their, so if she had done the, you know, an original flight to New York, she'd go to New York, what have you. But they all had to wear their 
uniforms, and she was very proud of herself that she could still fit in her uniform. Um, but in here is a picture of 25 years of the different uniforms that the stewardesses wore. And it's quite interesting. You can see how they tried to modernize, and all of a sudden there's a fellow in there because uh, a few years later, that's when they started bringing stewards in when they could have more than one person on the plane. Because you must remember, there was only one stewardess for each flight. There was, that was it. Uh, she was it. So there you go. Anyway, I, I hope that was